My name is Mark Zitter, and I'm moderator for today's program with Dr. Sandra Vallejo. I am a proud member of the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Club and the founder and CEO of the Zetema Project, which hosts conversations on the most important healthcare issues faced in the U.S. Now, as hard as it is to believe, about 20 months ago, I moderated the first virtual conversation on the pandemic for the Commonwealth Club. That was in March of 2020, when we were all just learning about the coronavirus, its impact, and how it was spread, and how communities can combat it and protect their populations. Since that very first uh, conversation, the club has held more than 150 different programs on the pandemic. And we couldn't have done it without the great members and donors who have stuck with us throughout this pandemic. As we transition back to in-person programming at our club in San Francisco, there's no better time to become a member. So I encourage you to support the club, which by the way, is the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. You can do that by visiting www.commonwealthclub.org to learn more about our in-person programming coming up and how to become a member. Thank you for that. Now on to today's program. All of us have learned a lot about pandemics since 2020, including the importance of planning for one. And on that note, I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Dr. Sandra Galea, and welcome him back to the Commonwealth Club. We'll be discussing his new book, The Contagion Next Time, which describes the major forces shaping health in our society and how we can strengthen them to prevent, unfortunately, what is likely to be another pandemic at some point, or actually to keep the next outbreak from becoming a pandemic. Sandra Galea is Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at the Boston University School of Public Health. When he was appointed to that role, he was the youngest Dean of a School of Public Health in the US. He has been named an, epi- an epidemiology innovator by Time and one of the world's most influential scientific minds by Thomson Reuters. A native of Malta, he has served as a field physician for Doctors Without Borders and has held academic positions at Columbia University, the University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. So Sandro, welcome back to the Commonwealth Club to discuss your important new book. Thank you for having me, Mark. One tip to the audience before we get started. If you have a question for Dr. Galea or for me, please place it in the YouTube chat box and the questions will be forwarded to me throughout the program. I will get to as many as possible. I'll apologize in advance. I probably can't get to all of them, but please, we encourage your questions. So Sandra, perhaps the most obvious question just to get started is that there's lots of books that have come out and are coming out about the pandemic. So why did you feel you needed to write one? Yeah, in in many respects, I actually wrote this book because I knew there would be lots of books coming out during the pandemic. And my thinking was as follows. This pandemic is going to come. It will go away eventually. We're not sure when, but it'll go away eventually. And what is really going to feel like it's saved us as our vaccines and therapeutics. And I think the vaccines have been remarkable. We've had extraordinary vaccines that are safe, that they are efficacious in record time, which is really tremendous. So I think we're going to see a lot written about vaccines, vaccine stockpiles, about surveillance systems, about the need to be prepared from a biomedical perspective for the next pandemic. And I think that's all important. I suppose my central thesis, though, is that that by itself, while necessary, is not sufficient. Because if that's all we do, we are not really going to deal with the fundamental challenges that emerged during the pandemic. And the fundamental challenges that emerged during the pandemic were not because we didn't have vaccines, because we actually got vaccines pretty quickly. It was because we had social economic structures that served us poorly, because we had particular groups of our population that were tremendously vulnerable. And because we as a whole society were sitting ducks for the harms of a pandemic like this, because we are much less healthy than we need to be. So fundamentally, we need to tend to these other issues. And I wanted to make sure there was a book that said that, that was part of this whole panoply of books, as you're saying, part of the conversation. I want to make sure that in your 150 plus conversations, you have a conversation about these issues so that it's part of the mix. Great. Thank you. Well, you know, you set the table by starting the book, uh, talking not about the pandemic, but more broadly about how much of our health is due to public health activities rather than medical care. And why did you think that was so important a distinction that you made it to start the book out? Well, I think we tend to think of our health as what is caused by our doctor. And, you know, you mentioned in my bio that uh, my own personal journey, I'm trained as a doctor and I did uh, uh, medical work in some remote parts of the world, including places like Somalia. 
And it was while I was there, while I was actually doing you know, important doctoring, like doing things with my own hands and helping people get better, that I started to think of, there must be a way in which I can be part of keeping people healthy, not simply making them better when they were sick, which is important, but also to keep people healthy. And I started to, then I went back to school and, and went to public health to learn that. What one learns is that the biggest advances in our health as a country and as a world have happened, not because of doctoring, but it's because we have created a world that generates health. Now, let me just be concrete about that. In 1800, 200 years ago, which 200 years in human, in human history, right, is, is a blink of an eye, it's nothing. We could expect to live till age 40. Our life expectancy was 40. Now our life expectancy is getting close to 80. That is a doubling of life expectancy in just 200 years, which is really extraordinary. Life expectancy for humans had grumbled along around 40 for essentially thousands and thousands of years. So what made the difference? What made the difference was that we started cleaning up cities. We started cleaning up the air around us. We started having safe drinking water. We started having safe food to eat. We started having less violence, clean houses to live in. We started having livable wages, which meant that people could actually afford a better standard of living. We started having clean parks and opportunities for exercise. All of that is what fundamentally transformed our health. And we doubled our life expectancy, which is really perhaps the single biggest triumph in the history of health in, uh, in the history of humankind. And, and that is also where we stand to improve. That's also where we as a country fall short compared to other high-income countries. We certainly don't fall short in medicines and therapeutics and our ability to develop vaccines faster than anybody else. We are really doing very well on that. But we need to do much better in these forces that are really the forces that contribute the most to our health. So in many ways, uh, while medical care can help prolong our lives, public health interventions uh, sort of delay our dying prematurely, and that's had a much larger impact on that growth in life expectancy over the years. Yeah, when, when you look at, um, and you know, Mark, you call them public health interventions, and I, I actually wouldn't even call them that, because I think sometimes when we think of public health interventions, we think of, it's something that public health does. These efforts are improving the world around us that falls to many sectors, providing housing for everybody, providing clean air, providing, making sure that we do not have, die from motor vehicle accidents, making sure that we're not in violent neighborhoods. These are the work of multiple sectors, not just the public health. In fact, what public health is about is about bringing these sectors together to make, to, to make sure that what they do generates health rather than harms health. And I think that's the big realization I'm trying to push to say, we need to do better in all these other sectors so that we can be healthier so that we can be more resilient when the next pandemic hits. Because fundamentally, the damage, the big damage from this pandemic was because we were less healthy than we should have been, and we were unprepared. We did not have the social structures to defend ourselves against this pandemic. I think related to that is the claim, I thought it was quite interesting. You know, you say in the book, you think about health as a public good, whereas I think most Americans would kind of assume it's really personal. It's a personal responsibility, it's a personal issue. So how do you think that America's focus on individual liberty has shaped the way we collectively understand and invest in, in our health? Yeah, I think that misunderstanding of health as a personal good really stems from this conflation we're talking about. What is personal, what we can buy or sell is sick care, is our ability to get medicines or to get surgery or to get treatment when we are sick. But when you understand that your health and my health is due to where we live, due to the air around us that we breathe when we go outside, to whether or not we have a safe neighborhood in which to walk, whether or not the food we eat is healthy, you quickly realize that actually you don't have that much control over many of those things. Many of those things are shaped by the world around us, by policies and politics that are larger than any one of us as individuals. And when you understand that, you realize, oh, well, maybe I actually can't buy my health the way I thought I could. What we can buy is treatment once we're already sick. But to be healthy, we need collective action, which is where we get to health being a public good. And I talk about this in the book, and I talk about how there is a conceptual shift we need to make to recognize that our health depends on our collective action. And that is different than the typical conversation we have. In some respects, what I'm trying to do is try to get us to say that all the proverbial kitchen table conversations, when somebody says to a relative, what matters most to your health? And the relative doesn't say, my doctor. The relative says, the fact that I live in a safe house, the fact that actually I have food to eat, 
the fact that I can go outside and not be worried about dying from violence. That's mm-hmm. what determines my health. And you know, we've done surveys to ask people what they think matters most to their health. And and most Americans continue to think it's their doctors, it's their nurse, it's their clinical provider. And that is a misconception. Mm-hmm. You had some interesting illustrations in the book of some of these concepts. Tell us what we can learn about health as a public good from the Roman general Marcus Licinius Crassus. Yes. So it's uh, this is a, a, a I talk about firefighting in the, in the, in the book and, uh, you know, the, the, fi- the fire departments, which were started by General Crassus, were um, put in place to uh, to because as, as Rome and, uh, and its empire was consolidating, it was realized there were fires and we need something to help put out these fires. And and really, that started the modern fire department and uh, to this day. Now, what's interesting, the reason I bring up fire departments is as follows is fire departments operated much the same way for hundreds of years. There was fire happens, some sort of bell, whether it's analog or digital, and fire, firefighters go out, they run, and they put out the fire. But about 40, 50 years ago in this country, fire departments started realizing maybe we can be part of preventing fires from happening. Maybe we can be actually part of the solution, not simply fixing the problem that already happens. And fire departments started making the shift into working with municipalities, working with homeowners, d- developing the protocols that actually prevent fire, create safe homes. And as a result, the number of fires per house per person in this country has dropped by half over the past 40 years. Now, fire, depart- fire departments still exist. We still need firefighters because there are still occasional fires and we still need firefighters to, to deal with them. But can we not all agree that it's a better world, it's a better country because we have fewer fires? I mean, you know, if we we're in person, I would ask people to show show hands. Would anybody prefer us to have more fires? I don't think so. I think we all agree that we'd rather have fewer fires. And I think firefighters have actually led the way. And in many respects, we need health doctors in this country to also lead the way to say, we will always need doctors. We'll always need doctors to restore us to health if we're sick. But aren't we all better off if we're not sick to begin with? Yeah, and the fire example is an interesting one, too, because just as with a pandemic, we can't completely keep ourselves healthy if everybody else is sick or other people are sick. Same with fires. You can have a very fireproof house and be pretty safe there. But if the rest of the city is on fire, your house is probably going to suffer, too. Yeah, and this, this is why the pandemic is such a teachable moment. The reason it's such a teachable moment is because I think it, it, it has been too easy for us over the years to say, you know, Mark, I may care for you because I'm a nice guy and I don't want you to be sick, but really out of the charity of my heart, you know, I'll do what I can to help you, but ultimately your health is your problem. What the pandemic has done is it's illustrated, well, actually it's not the case because your health is my health are intimately linked because I now know that if you have COVID, I actually have a higher risk of getting COVID. If somebody else has COVID, I have a higher risk of getting COVID. So it really has shown us how interlinked our health is, that it's no longer good enough to say, we might care about other people's health just out of the goodness of our heart. Yes, we should do that. But we should also care about other people's health because it affects our own health. So I think the pandemic really illustrates how intertwined our health, our health is, that it's not only the morally right thing to do to be compassionate and care about everybody's health because of the, from a frame of shared humanity, it is also the smart thing to do to improve our own individual health. And I think it's illustrated that our individual health is inextricable from our collective health. And I think that's a really important shift in our thinking. I think it is. And it's, 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 I think it's, it's one that takes a little bit of time to get used to. I know you're not only a public health expert, but you're an educator. So you've had a lot of practice helping people think through this. And, um, you know, I was struck, you, you wrote that uh, we can't buy health for ourselves. We can buy health care, but not health. And we can only buy health care after we're already sick. And I thought one of the ways you illustrated this, uh, the whole this dichotomy well, was your soccer game analogy for our approach yes. to health. Could you share that? Yeah. So I, um, soccer is the sport I like. It's my sport. I, I grew up playing soccer and my kids played a lot of soccer. So I, I sort of thought I would use a soccer analogy. So the analogy is as follows. So you have soccer. How's the game played? You have 11 people on one side, 11 people on the other side. And the, the, the game is a very simple game, which is why it's so popular worldwide. All you have to do is you have to get the ball into the net of the other team. And from your 11 players, 10 of them can only use their feet. That's why the game is called football in many parts of the world. But one player, the goalie, they can use their whole body to stop the ball from going into the net. Now, if nobody ever scores on you, nobody ever can get the ball into the goal, 
you'll never lose because really you lose by people scoring on you. Now, if I were to tell you that, having told you those rules, I'll say to you, take a billion dollars and create the world's best soccer team. Now you might say, hmm, well, I've heard what he said. So let me take a billion dollars and invest them all in the goalkeeper to make sure that I have the best possible goalkeeper. But here's the problem. If you do that, you then you look, look at a professional soccer game. What do you see happen? The goalkeeper is prowling their area and they're constantly yelling at their fellow players, keep the ball away from it. Because for anybody who's ever played soccer or anybody who's had a kid who played soccer, you know that the soccer net is very big. Even the best goalkeeper in the world, balls will still get past her or him. So the good goalkeeper by themselves is not enough. To win the soccer game, you need a good goalkeeper. But you also need the other 10 players to move the ball upfield. And those other 10 players are the houses we live in, whether or not there's violence around us, whether or not we are, there's, there's structural racism that keeps particular groups of people away from access to resources, whether or not we have safe water, whether or not we have safe food, whether or not we have safe neighborhoods. All those are the other 10 players. And you need those 10 players and also the goalkeeper. And the goalkeeper, of course, is medicine. You need all of those players to actually win at soccer. And similarly, you need all of that to improve our health. And I, I have yet to find anybody who tells me that they disagree with that. Like, I think fundamentally this message I'm, 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 I'm conveying is intuitive. I think people, once, once it's explained to them, people understand it. It's just not how we're used to thinking. And I don't think there's anything particularly difficult about this. I just think it's different than how we've been used to thinking about health. We've been used to thinking about health as a solo sport. With the goalie by, with the goalie by themselves, I can win. Well, once you realize that to produce health, you need a whole soccer team, you realize, oh, with the goalie by themselves, I'm not going to win. Right, right. Yeah, I had a college friend who in high school had the lowest uh, rate of goals scored against him uh, in his high school league. But he said he pretty much never touched the ball because the two fullbacks were all state. And so no one ever got the ball near him in that way. So well, it, it's true. It's true. What you're really saying is if, if we've got the healthy uh, society, you won't need to see a doctor very often. So it, you'd, you'd rather have a healthy society and an average doctor than a, a poor society that's not very healthy and a great doctor, right? Because by then it's, it's later than you want it to get. Oh. So... Um, these kinds of changes you talk about, things we need to worry about, better housing, uh, less structural racism, eliminating that, um, fewer uh, wealth inequalities, uh, better jobs, uh, better cleaner air, and so forth. Um, you generally call those foundational changes in our society, and they really are foundational to who we are. Now, changing them would help. I think there's no question about that. But it seems like being able to change those really involves some pretty tectonic political shifts. And at this point, we, it's harder enough to get the opposing sides even to agree on facts politically. So how do you think we can affect these changes and how much do you, how far do you think we really can go with them? Yeah, I suppose the question is, what do you see as the role of politics? And I, I think if one sees politics and political leadership as leading us and giving us a vision to aspire to, then we're in trouble. But I don't see politics that way. I see political leadership as following the public conversation, as following where we are all at. And as a result, I actually think this conversation is what matters. I think this conversation, the conversation that others will have based on this conversation, that is what will change our collective thinking. And I think politics will follow. There's a concept which I refer to in the book of called the Overton window. And the Overton window is, it, it, it's named after o Overton. And it's a window of what we consider to be acceptable conversation. What do we actually talk about? And the point about the Overton window is that that window shifts, is that we can shift what it is that we talk about. And what I'm arguing is that once th this conversation becomes lingua franca, once it becomes a conversation everybody's having, we will then have politicians who in primaries will debate whether a particular plan they have for sanitation, for transportation, for housing, how it will affect health. When we see that in presidential primaries, that's how we know this conversation will have arrived. It's when politicians recognize that decisions they're making about a whole range of things affect health. Well, I'll admit, as I read through some of these things, I thought, well, this is very idealistic and it's never going to happen. But then you point out, uh, or, and I thought of a few examples where actually it has happened. I think our, our air is a lot cleaner on average in America than it used to be. And, and please give the example about uh, smoking. Yeah, so smoking is an excellent example. And I've talked about many other examples, but smoking used to be ubiquitous. 80% of adults used to smoke. That, that means 
it, it was everywhere. It was actually one of the cool stories about smoking is that the, the when the very first studies that showed the harm of smoking started, these were in the 1930s in England, mm-hmm. those studies initially didn't even collect data about whether or not people smoked or not. And you know why? It never even crossed the investigator's mind to be wrong with smoking because everybody did it. It was, yeah. it was so common. Today, smoking is about in the teens in terms of 10 to 15% in terms of adults. So how did that happen? Well, first of all, there was about 20, 30 years of data being collected from 1930 to 1960. In the 1960s, 1964, to be precise, there was a very influential report by the Surgeon General that said, look, smoking is killing people. It causes cancer, it causes heart disease. And then slowly, what started happening is people who were people looked up to, movie stars and, and uh, other influential figures, they started saying that I shouldn't stop, I, I, we shouldn't be smoking. People started dying who were seen clearly to be linked to deaths due to um, smoking. And slowly, slowly, the conversation changed. Slowly, slowly, the conversation changed such that now everybody knows smoking is harmful. And even if people are smoking, they realize that they're doing something harmful to themselves. And, you know, I look at my children, my children would look at smoking as very, they're very clear that it's harmful, which is a tremendous generational shift. Now, of course, this takes time. Remember I said the Surgeon General's report was in 1964. So now we're dealing with 50, 55 years later. So these cultural shifts do take time. And, but at the same time, they also are transformative. I mean, another example, which uh, I mentioned in the book is uh, motor vehicle accidents. So car accidents and car deaths. So in the past century, we have reduced deaths from motor vehicle accidents by 200 fold, which means for every vehicle mile you drive, your chances of dying are 200 times less than they were a century ago. Now, that's extraordinary, 200 times less. And I often challenge people and say, well, why is that? Is it because drivers are 200 times better? I mean, nobody in their right mind thinks that drivers today are 200 times better than they were 100 years ago. Let's just face it, that's just an extraordinary get, right? How do we achieve that? We achieve it by seat belts, by airbags, by shatterproof glass, by laws to make sure that we're not driving when we're under the influence of alcohol and all of that. And everybody understands that. Now, those were hard won battles, right? There was seat belts took a good 10 to 20 years to become something that everybody did. They've become 10 to 20 years to become where they are today, which is you don't even think about it being under your car, it's just what you do. But if you go back to the 1960s, if I were to tell you, can you imagine a future where everybody gets in their car and puts on this belt that restrains them? You might say to me, I don't know, Sandra, it's pretty idealistic. It's, that's, that's gonna be hard to do. To which the answer is, it is hard to do, but we did it and it's, it takes time. It takes changing the conversation. It takes changing culture until what is, what is previously unimaginable becomes the obvious. And the obvious becomes something that we do without even thinking about. It. Yeah. How much of this is uh, an American phenomenon? I mean, you, you write that uh, in America, in many ways, that we, our investment in healthcare, healthcare, the medical system, comes to the expense of our investment in some of these other foundational drivers. So uh, how does that work in the US? How do you compare it with other, other countries in our choices that we make there? I, I think we in, in this country have a over-reliance on the ethos of individual ownership of our health, of individual um, ownership of these ideas, which, which is evidenced by our overspending on our health much more than other countries. But I don't think that the phenomenon is unique to this country. I think when we've actually, we've done surveys across countries where the plurality of people across countries keep thinking that health is being driven mostly by their doctor, by their nurse, by their clinical provider. So I do think there is a collective global shift in the conversation that needs to happen. But just to talk about globally for a second, just to make one other uh, illustration, we spend more as a country on our health than any other country in the world. We spend quite a bit more, by about 40% more, which means if other countries spend a dollar, we're spending a dollar 40. Despite that, we have the worst health compared to any of our high income peers. I'm just comparing us to high income countries. Now, my challenge to anybody listening is this Can you think of any other sector, any other sector, where we spend more and get less? And the answer is it's impossible to think of another sector. I mean, if I were to tell you, take your smartphone, and your smartphone is going to cost you more than it would cost you to buy it in any other high income country, but it holds less data and is slower and the camera is not as good. I mean, you'd say, well, something's wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with, with, with the state of commerce. How, how is that possible? But that's what we do with health, actually, which really we shouldn't do, right? It, it, it sort of sounds absurd. Like, why do we accept spending more and getting less? I think 
we as a country should be okay with spending more if we get more. Like if I said to you, look, we spend more on health, but you know what? We live longer, healthier lives than everybody else. Now we can have an argument, but whether it's worth it for us or not. But I think most of us would feel like, okay, all right, we spend more, we get more, we get more of it, but we spend more and we get less. And that's a problem. That should not be the case. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the suggestions you make in the book is uh, as a way to move us towards this, these foundational issues and, and, and in terms of at least emphasizing them more than we are currently vis-a-vis the uh, medical issues, is that the U.S. or all countries could adopt some kind of an international resolution uh, following this pandemic that all governments would actually measure the health impacts of any of the policies they have under consideration. I thought that was a novel idea. Why do you think that would help? And do you think there's any possibility it could actually happen? Yeah, so there's been a movement for about a couple of decades called the Health and All Policies Movement. And the idea is this, is that metaphorically, every cabinet minister is a minister of health. Obviously, it's not the case, but you have the minister of transportation, you have the minister of finance, you have the minister responsible for housing, minister responsible for sanitation. And all those ministers, and this is at the federal level, one could talk about the local level, the state level, et cetera. Every one of them, decisions they make affect their health affect health because Minister of Transportation is going to make a decision. She's going to make a decision about the type of mass transit and where you put bus depots and that's going to affect health. The Minister of Housing, she's going to make a decision about the type of housing that's zone in particular neighborhoods and that's going to affect people's health to live in them. So the idea is health in all policies where we're explicit that health emerges from all policies and as a result, we are explicit about measuring that. One can do something called a health impact assessment. And what that means is to say, let's take the transportation decision. If you, the transportation minister, are making a decision about a particular set of highways, particular um, form, uh, formation of highways, which are going to pollute particular neighborhoods, we should assess what health impact that's going to have. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to do it. I don't want people listening saying, well, we're just making an argument for never doing anything. Not at all. I mean, we as a society need to move forward. There are things we need to do. But at least we can be upfront about it and say, what are the costs we're incurring? And is this cost worth it? Is this, benefit, is this benefit worth this cost? Or maybe there's something else different that we can do because we realize we have become being transparent about the health consequences. That's what a health impact assessment would do. And that is essentially surfaces what is already the case. Like nothing I'm saying is new. The, the fact that these decisions in these other sectors affect health is what happens all the time. This would simply elevate it and make it visible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know there's a couple of countries in the world that actually have a happiness index and yes, well, national well, happiness, whatever. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. And, well, and, this, and this gets to, this gets to, of course, now, now we're getting into an even more philosophical question, which is what do we mean by health? And, yeah. uh, you know, health fundamentally, from my perspective, and I think, you know, building on the preamble to the World Health Organization um, uh, charter is health is a state of complete well-being, which is essentially health should be the means, not an end. And, and I also talk about this in the book. You and I, we don't live to be healthy. We are healthy so we can live. And that's an important distinction. If I may use another metaphor, go back to the car metaphor. Not many people like taking their car to the shop. You don't really, what you'd like to do is just your car to drive and you like your car to take you places, right? Yeah. That's the car's health. The, the, the point of the car is not for it to be healthy. The point of the car is to take you places. And similarly for our health, the point of health is for you to be able to do the job you love, for me to be able to do the job I love, for us to be able to self-actualize. And that gets at health essentially getting out of our way, which is, of course, why we should care so much about building a world that generates health, because we want to get on with our lives. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed that health is the thing that we take most for granted when we have it. Don't think about it. And it's the only thing we can think about when we're lacking it. Until okay. there's a pandemic. And, and, and of course, the pandemic has been very instructive on this, right? Because we have seen our health threatened. And as our health has been threatened, what we've seen is that all of a sudden our living has been threatened, right? And our efforts to mitigate the pandemic have threatened our ability to, to do things we want to do. And what has really affected us most in the time of pandemic is the fact that we've had various degrees of restrictions on our living. There's been yeah. a threat to health, which has been a direct threat to our living, and it's showing how the two are inextricable. Right. You know, we've touched on uh, some issues about racism, but I want to drill into that a bit more. It was an interesting, uh, I guess, coincidence that just after the pandemic really hit last in the spring of 2020, that uh, George Floyd was murdered and really raised the national consciousness about uh, racism in America. 
And I think it's been widely reported that people of color suffered disproportionately due to COVID-19. Why was that? And how should we think about it as we prepare for the next pandemic? Yeah, so I think this really gets at the heart of why injustice, social, economic, racial injustice matters so much to everything that I'm saying. So let's take um, the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 for people of color. And there was disproportionate burden among Black Americans and among Latinx Americans, among Indigenous Americans. But let's just, by way of illustration, focus on Black Americans versus white Americans, just by way of illustration. So Black Americans died at twice the rate of white Americans during the pandemic. Now, that's, broad, that's broadly known, that's widely known. But the question is why, Looks, so why was that? So when one digs a bit deep in, deeply into that, there are two reasons broadly why the black American death rate was higher than white American death rate. Number one is there was greater risk of getting COVID. And number two was greater risk of getting severe COVID. So let me talk about each of them. Why greater risk of getting COVID? Well, COVID was a respiratory disease. The risk of COVID, was higher if you were in contact with other people. And who was able to protect themselves from being in contact with other people? Well, people with high wage jobs that allowed you to work from home. We know this. We've known this for decades that the higher wage job you have, the more flexibility you have, the more ability you are to work from home. Lower wage jobs, which are disproportionately occupied by people of color, and in particular in this case, Black Americans, are less, we're less able to work from home. So the pandemic hits. Lower wage jobs, people in lower wage jobs are not able to work from home, and they're actually a threat of losing their job as, of course, economy, the economy shuts down. So Black Americans all of a sudden are more exposed to the virus and have a higher rate of getting the virus. So that's reason one, which is entirely dependent on our economic structure and on the fact that for reason, historical reasons, which we'll get to in a second, Black Americans are disproportionately represented among lower wage jobs. Now, how about more severe COVID? Well, we've known from the beginning of COVID that what makes COVID severe is having underlying other illness, having diabetes, having heart disease, having lung disease. Well, we have long had a health gap that persons of color, Black Americans specifically, have more underlying disease than the white Americans. And that also reflects centuries of disadvantage. So as a result, once higher COVID and then more severe COVID once it hits, meant that Black Americans were more likely to die from COVID by quite a bit, by twofold more than white Americans. Now, why is it that we've had economic structures that disadvantage Black Americans? And why is it that those economic structures have also patterned poorer health among Black Americans and white Americans? Well, that goes back hundreds of years. That goes back to hundreds of years to the founding of the country, to the institution of slavery that was followed by then the, by the Jim Crow era and followed by decades in the, in the past century of structural racism that marginalizes Black Americans and having them bear a greater burden of disease. And just to concretize that for a second, because I realize that that last sentence sounds a bit abstract, let's take something very concrete. 1930s, American government wants to encourage Americans to own homes, to generate wealth. Homeowners Loan Corporation started, and the job of the Homeowners Loan Corporation was to help guide banks and encourage banks to lend money for mortgages. How did it go about doing that? Well, it would take maps of cities and it would color them in green, yellow, or red. And the green would be, be, say, this is a good place for you, the bank, to invest your money to make mortgage loans. The yellow is in between. And the red, we don't advise you to lend the money. Well, as you can imagine, the red areas were areas where African-Americans live predominantly. And that red marking of the map became known as redlining. Well, redlining in the 1930s means that Black Americans now have lower home ownership rate lower wealth accumulation, fewer resources, living in houses that on aggregate are not as good as those white Americans live in. Now you get to a pandemic where one of the reasons that the virus spreads is more crowding in homes. And all of a sudden, Black Americans have a greater risk of transmission of the virus. And as I said, couple that with greater severity of the virus because of underlying disease resulting in higher death rates for Black Americans. So really, you can see how this thread of Structural, structural institutionalized racism in the country's history manifests in very concrete consequences today. They man it manifests in differential death from a pandemic that we had never heard of until end of 2019, beginning of 2020, between Black Americans and white Americans. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. Let's assume. Uh, let's 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 turn this uh, more back towards the the contagion next time. Uh, mm -hmm. 
so at some point in the future, let's say another virus emerges, uh, somehow similar to COVID-19, somehow different. And let's say that people have been reading your book and talking about it, and we've improved on some of these areas with racism and uh, some of the other fundamental, the foundational issues that you're talking about. Um, how would that make our experience of the next pandemic different? I think it would make the experience dramatically different. I think if we recognize that the pandemic is going to hit vulnerable groups worse than others, and we made decisions that specifically protected more vulnerable groups, those are people with underlying illness, those are people who, are, who already are vulnerable to the virus, we're going to see much less death in those groups, number one. Number two, if by then we are a healthier world, by definition, we're going to be less vulnerable to the virus because the virus, again, we've known this since January of 2020. You're more likely to die from the virus if you have underlying illness. In fact, one of the things that has been more publicized in the virus, if you have no underlying illness, your chance of dying from the virus is actually quite low. It's actually quite unusual to die from the virus if you have no underlying illness. So we are already more resilient as individuals. And if we now have systems in place where we're recognized that we want to protect the people who are most vulnerable, we are immediately going to see us preventing a lot more deaths than have happened this time. Because there is a reason why we as a country have had more deaths than any other country. And that reason is that we were not, we as a country were not as healthy as we should have been. And we were essentially sitting ducks for the consequences of a virus like this. And then we were not positioned to protect those who are more vulnerable because of our economic structures and our social structures that actually marginalized and put those more vulnerable even more at risk. Okay. Now, um, I think everybody was impressed by how rapidly we created vaccines and uh, how effective they were. Really amazing. Uh, so we're all celebrating that. But you urge us to be careful about making big, broad assumptions about our country's ability to combat future pandemics based on how we were able to escape this one and who was able to escape this one. Why should we be cautious about that? Well, first of all, I, I want to be very clear that I think vaccines are amazing. I think I think that we got to, it's even hard to remember now that in summer of 2020, we're saying, well, what if we get the vaccines with 50% efficacy? But instead, come the fall, we have two, not just one, two vaccines with more than 90% efficacy. They're efficacious, they're very safe, and it's really incredible. And it's really a uh, a triumph of biomedical science. So we should be very, very clear about that. That's number one. Number two, my fundamental point is that the vaccine in itself is not enough. If I were to go back to my football analogy, my soccer analogy. Remember, the goalie itself is never going to be enough because you are still going to lose with enough balls coming at the, at the goalkeeper. Similarly, the vaccine's coming at a point where we already have enormous number of deaths. Now, number three, developing vaccines is one thing. Vaccinating people is another thing altogether. The vaccinating people depends on people trusting the system enough to actually want to get vaccinated. And right now, as you and I are talking in November of 2021, I'm actually saying the date because I, I'm sure this, this will be different six months from now, somebody's listening to it six months from now, we still have 20, 30% of Americans, of adults, who don't want to get vaccinated. Now, and if you look at that, you'll see that that's actually patterned also by, by socioeconomic position and by race. Now, one could take the approach saying, how could people possibly not want the vaccine? Mm -hmm. Or one could actually take a step back and say, why would people who've had no reason to believe that the system is working in their favor before all of a sudden turn on a dime and trust that the system is working in their favor. That's the fundamental problem. And that trust doesn't get built in a day. It doesn't matter how good the vaccines are. I can say till I'm blue in the face, these vaccines are safe, they're efficacious. Everybody please get vaccinated. Well, if you've never felt like that the health system was there for you, if you've never felt actually the system was giving you things that are actually needed and you look around and you know that people like you have more diabetes, more heart disease, more lung disease, than people, than everybody else, and you've known that this is unjust all your life, why would you believe that this is going to change overnight? So I think we are in some respects reaping the injustice we have sown. You know, you made the reference to the civil unrest in the summer of 2020 that followed the killing of unarmed black men and women, particularly George Floyd. And, and that civil unrest, which was the largest civil unrest the country's ever seen really by number of people who were involved in protests. It, while it was triggered, it was, it was catalyzed by these killings, it wasn't just about that, right? It was, it, was a, it was a mass awareness of the underlying injustices 
that were shaping actually the COVID pandemic. It was the, the country was was dawning to realizing how is this possible? How is it possible the United States we are allowing a coronavirus to affect us differently depending on the color of our skin, which is biologically a negligible trait. And, and all of a sudden it became clear that this was reflecting these underlying injustices, which were then being manifested in those particular shootings. So I think it was a real eye-opening moment. I think it was a moment which shed the scales from many people's eyes. And I think it was a critical moment in this country's history. And I hope that we'll look back on this as an inflection point for these issues. Yeah, we've been talking about uh, racial injustice and differences. What about uh, economics? Uh, is, is wealth inequality a cause of public health problems, or is it actually the reverse? Is it an effect of them? Well, it, it, it's a great question. It's actually a question which uh, there's a lot of science about. It's probably a bit of both, but fundamentally, it is primarily a cause. Because when you realize that, when you realize that in order to be healthy, you need to have a safe neighborhood, safe housing, food, water, air, stable income, and all that, all of that is bought by, made more available by wealth. So wealth is one of the central driving force to our health. You know, I'm sometimes asked, what's the one thing I can do to make my health better? And when I'm feeling perhaps a, a bit cheeky, I say, you should choose to be born to well-educated, wealthy parents, which, of course, none of us choose to do who we're born to. But the reason I'm making the point is because that is the, the surest way to know you're going to be put on trajectory to a healthy life. Now, in part, I say that, not just to be annoying, but in part, I say that to remind us of the accidents of our birth. And we should not be living in a world where random accidents of our birth determine the full trajectory of our lifetime of, lifetime, lifetime of health. We should be in a world where the accident or the randomness of our birth does not consign us to good health or bad health just because of who we're born to. And that is what it would take to undo the economic injustice that influences health. So let me uh, push the economic point a little further, because you, you mentioned that, uh, you point out that global economic development probably has done more for health than any medicine that we've devised along the way. So talk more about how economic health uh, relates to public health. And then I guess the, the follow on from that is, what should we do about the trade-offs between uh, locking down to prevent infection and keeping economic act activity going? There's sort of a trade-off or a conflict there, right? Yeah, so let, let me start with the latter question. This latter question is a really interesting one. And there is no question that economic health determines health, physical health. And the decisions that were made about economic, that affected economic well-being, let me use the term just to avoid confusion, around the time, at time of COVID, were really troubling to my mind. I think they were really troubling in no small part because those of us who were in decision-making authority were making decisions that affected largely other people who were not in decision-making authority. To be concrete, the people in, who are making in the top half of wages in the country those jobs have only increased in time of COVID. In the bottom half of wages in the country, we have about 20% fewer jobs than there were before the pandemic. So, of course, it's people in the top half of wages who are in a position of making decisions about lockdowns and about what we shut down in our economy affecting the other half. And mm -hmm. hopefully when I'm saying this, everybody here says something wrong with that. This half, making decisions that are hurting only this half. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have had lockdowns. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm simply saying that the burden of this particular approach was born entirely here and made the decisions were made by people here. And I think that that's problematic. Here's a statistic that I have, that I've used with our students. What is the one dimension on which Congress is least representative of the population? Now people often say gender, race. But there's, it's not perfectly representative, but actually Congress is not bad on gender and race. The one dimension which Congress is representative of the general population is four-year college degree. Fewer than 5% of members of Congress do not have a four-year college degree, while 65% of Americans do not have a four-year college degree. Now, decisions that are made by Congress are disproportionately affecting people who do not have a four-year college degree, which essentially has no representation in Congress. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that's problematic. Now, one could argue we want people in Congress to be better educated in the general population. That's fine. I, I'm, I'm in full agreement with that. But when the consequences are borne by a particular group, 
that is that is different than the group making decisions, I think we're all human. And I think we all realize that that may be resulting in decisions that are not fully weighting the depth of the consequences of what we're doing. And had we had this conversation, we might have made decisions differently. Another example, of course, is schools. Now you're in San Francisco, which has a, had a particularly fraught relationship to school closures over the course of COVID. Yeah. And we, we, we have closed schools. Again, I think we should give ourselves a pass on what happened in March, April of 2020 when everybody was afraid. But once we got a handle on what was going on, we kept schools closed for a very long time for children, even though we knew that children were not very likely to get COVID. If they got COVID, it was not very severe, and they actually were not likely to transmit COVID. In fact, the risk of children dying in a car accident on the way to school is much higher than the risk of children dying from COVID, substantially higher. Now, why did we do that? Well, we did it for a whole host of political reasons, but I suspect that part of it is also because in our heart of hearts, those who are making decisions felt like, well, my kids are going to be fine. Well, who are the kids who actually are been most delayed by the fact we get schools closed? These are kids who are in schools that predominantly serve uh, kids of color, kids in schools that are under-resourced. So again, we made decisions that affect economic and educational function, that affect the groups that are most marginalized to begin with, and deepening wealth gaps, economic gaps, and health gaps. And, and that's, that's not right. We should be better than that. So we made some trade-offs, but may not have made them as well as we might have. Well, I think we made trade. I think we made trade-offs without being explicit about the trade-offs, and without being explicit about who the tr- who was actually s- losing in these trade-offs. It yeah. is one thing for for you and I to make a decision about trade-offs that affect all our lives. It's another thing altogether to make a trade-off that will help us and hurt them, right? Who, and, and I'm using us, them, in, in in a sense to anybody over there affecting people over here, and and that's just not right. Let me talk more about trade-offs because I, I, meant, I noticed in the book that you quoted the late William Bicknell, who's also at Boston University, defining public health as, let me get this right, the art and science of deciding who dies, when, and with what degree of misery. So it sounds like public <laughs> health has a lot of trade-offs involved. What were, it, it does. what were the other main trade-offs we faced with COVID-19? And do you think we'll have the same trade-offs or different ones during the next pandemic? I think we always have trade-offs. I think uh, uh, Dr. Bicknell was correct. Public health is always about trade-offs. And I think we should be honest about that. I mean, take uh, some other contentious issues, move it, move it aside of, from, the, from the pandemic space. Take issues around uh, firearms, around guns, about gun ownership. Well, it's a matter of trade-offs. There is an industry that is benefiting. There are people who are dying. And we should be saying, Are we? is the trade-off to have an industry that benefits this much worth this many deaths. Now, when I say that, I bet anybody listening says, well, that, that sounds, that makes that uneasy, right? Like, we, 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 but that is effectively what we're saying. One of my favorite examples of trade-offs, which I refer to in the book, is a very simple one. The higher the speed limit, the more people die on roads. If the speed limit's 35, you have fewer people die. 45, you have more people die. 55 more people die. 65 more people die. We make trade-off decisions about speed limits all the time. And essentially what we're saying, in order to get someplace X minutes faster, we're willing to tolerate Y more people dying. Now, if this makes you uncomfortable, anybody listening, it sort of should because it makes me uncomfortable even saying it, but that is how our society is structured all the time. So we should be honest about that, but perhaps equally importantly, we should make sure that the, the benefits and the risks accrue to the same person, to the same groups. So let me go back to the speed limit example. If I were to say to you, how would you feel if I said to you, we'll change the speed limit so that people of a particular racial group can get there faster and it's going to increase deaths among people of another racial group, not among those who get there faster. Like you'd say, wait a second, that's really not fair. But that's essentially some of the decisions that we made during COVID. That actually, we made decisions that benefited a particular group and the cost accrued only to another group. And, and that runs entirely against the principles on which we should be founding a society in 2021. That's the, fair, the fairness issue overall. Yeah, absolutely. The fairness issue, which, which, which I mean, broadly speaking, our system of governance, our, our social norms are established on enlightenment era principles, era principles that respect autonomy, respect fairness, respect reason, and ultimately aspire 
to create reforms that benefit all of us together. So you're not arguing that we don't have trade-offs. You're arguing that we should make them uh, in, a, in a fairer way. Overall. I'm arguing that A, we should be very clear about the trade-offs and we should be fair about who is bearing the, the negatives of the trade-offs. Yes. Okay. Well, the uh, foundational changes you make, you uh, would like to see made are, are ambitious. And let's say, say uh, I'm going to wave my magic wand and Sandra, I'm going to give you just one. What, what would be your top choice for an intervention to improve public health in the U.S., which you're trying to address? Oh yeah, yeah. The top choice is very clear. The top choice is that that conversation around the kitchen table in every kitchen table shifts so that uh, everybody realizes when they have the conversation, oh, what matters most to your health? Everybody says it's the house I have, it's the job I have, it's the neighborhood I live in. Once everybody says that, all everything else will follow. This is a little bit like Aladdin's magic wishes. You know, the, the wish that you want to have is to have infinite number of wishes, right? yeah. but. Yeah which is similar here is what I'm saying. Once the conversation changes, everything else I'm talking about will follow. And if you could choose an intervention, a public health intervention, is there a favorite one you have? Well, it's a, I know it's, a, it's very tempting to try to pin me down. Um, I, I'm actually not going to be pinned down. And the reason is very simple because while I'm actually trying to articulate a vision, I also want to be pragmatic about it. And I think different, different interventions may be implementable in different contexts, depending on the particularities of that context. And uh, I think any number of these efforts could make a difference. And I would encourage anybody in any level of any level of decision-making, be it local, be it state, be it federal, be it in, in private sector, be it in public sector, to do what is possible within this realm of thought. And all of these things together will add up to a much bigger difference. Mm -hmm. Well, you say in the book that we'll need to rely on on key values such as compassion and humility to prevent the next pandemic. You even have a whole chapter titled Compassion, which is unusual. Uh, my concern is, isn't it a lack of those and similar values that led to the conditions that made COVID-19 to be so devastating? And if Absolutely. that's the case, how do we increase how do we increase the expression of those values going forward? Well, I suppose that's why I wrote a whole chapter about them because I felt like they're really important. You know, compassion is, I, I distinguish compassion from empathy and empathy is, I see the world through your eyes. I can, I can imagine the world by, by through your shoes. And because I can do it, that I can understand how you feel. I want good things for you. That's empathy. Compassion is, you know, Mark, I really can't understand the world through your lens. Like, you know, we have very different lives. I actually don't know what the world looks like for you, but it doesn't matter. I still want good things for you. That's the difference between compassion and empathy. And compassion, to my mind, is integrally tied to this notion of the collective action needed to generate health. Compassion means once we understand that we care about each other's health, we then realize that we will do what it takes to create the context that generates our health, to create the better neighborhoods, to make sure there's actually everybody has a livable wage, to make sure that the uh, uh, transportation is such that serves people's needs rather than just pollutes neighborhoods of people who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's what compassion gives us. And so I think compassion is, uh, it's almost like the, the scaffolding on which everything else is built. That's mm -hmm. compassion. Now you ask also about humility. And you know, the, the point about humility is that I think we make a mistake when we hone in on the answer as being a far too simple answer that is dispositively inclined to say, we have one solution and that solution is medicine. And, and, and I think there's a hubris that goes with, with the opposite of humility, that goes with the power that high tech solutions have given us. And we need to have the humility to realize that that, while important, while necessary, is never going to be sufficient. Okay. Okay. Well, you're making the big picture argument about the importance of some of these foundational issues uh, to being prepared for the next contagion. Um, so I want to uh, ask you about how this has played out in the world uh, for this pandemic. Which countries do you believe have the best foundations currently? And uh, how did that relate to how they responded to the pandemic? Yeah, I think we saw, frankly, we, we saw a collapse of globally of our responses to the pandemic in many ways. But what we also saw is that countries that had health systems that were truly accessible to all, countries which were healthier to begin with, ended up doing better. And that's not a big surprise. It's not a big surprise because as we've been saying, 
the fact that we were sicker to begin with was a large part of the reason why we actually did as poorly as we did. And the fact that we did not trust the system is a large part of the reason why people did not uh, were not tended to the way they, they needed to. So any number of countries have things that we could learn from from them. There were particularly some countries in Asia, places like Singapore and uh, South Korea that did very well in the public health infrastructure that they had invested in to do the early testing, tracing, containment of the virus. There were countries in uh, uh, Western Europe that did much better than we did simply because their populations were healthier to begin with and have now emerged from the pandemic much faster than we have. So I think there are lessons to be learned from a range of countries around the world, but fundamentally, the lessons all center around having a healthier country to begin with, being prepared through having a public health infrastructure and not having the divisions that create health haves and health have nots that are then completely exploited by the virus. I see. Well, I have a hunch that we have some uh, aspiring or even current uh, public health people on the call. And since you're the head of a public health school, I wanted to ask you about the, the role of public health leadership in preparing for the next pandemic. And specifically, you've obviously thought very deeply about this because of your role in, in writing the book. How has the pandemic affected what you, uh, your vision for what your school should be doing or just practically what the school is doing uh, about public health training? Yeah, the, well, I think the, the I'm not sure there's good news or bad news. I think these thoughts that I've been um, having that I'm working on, pushing forward in this book are really reflect my evolving thinking and many people's evolving thinking in public health overall. I actually think this is the direction public health was headed. And I think the pandemic sharpens that and elevates it, but it doesn't inflect it. This is, this is really the direction we're headed and this is really how we were thinking. And I think a good school of public health teaches this to its students. And one of the most wonderful things in the past year has been to see the surge of interest among uh, young people in public health, the surge of interest in people who say, I've seen the ravages of a pandemic and I want to be part of the future, which can help when something like this happens. And that's, that's marvelous. I mean, that is what gives one hope. It, 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 in fact, it's, you, have to, you have to have a heart of stone not to be filled with hope when you see that because you're like, there's going to be a new generation that cares about these issues and hopefully they understand these foundations and they will lead us to a better world. So I'm, I'm excited to see the next generation and I'm excited to be led by the next generation. It seems it's, it's also suggests some other things. Like I would think that uh, maybe the role of uh, communications training in public health training has been elevated a bit because we know how important that is. And there's been much said about the CDC and the FDA and at, and at the state level also how things have been communicated. Do you see that as a, as a, as a more important I, part of public health? I, I, I do. I think it's important. But, but, you know, we've had, as have many other schools, we've, uh, we've, we have a certificate in uh, public health communication. We have, we have uh, training and leadership and management. S schools of public health have seen this wave emerging, and I think to varying degrees, we've all been, uh, I think, having the substrate, the educational substrate that is ready for students to be ready to deal with a pandemic like this. Now, whether or not those of us who are in positions of authority when this happened, I actually had the right training 20 years ago. I'm not sure, but certainly the training now is the right training to prepare people for the next pandemic. What we need is a committed generation. And also we need the funding broadly to grow the number of people who are in public health. I mean, we have had a shrinkage of the public health workforce in this country consistently year on year for the past 10 years. I, I think this will change. I think this will change. I think it will change in the public sector. I think it will change in the private sector. You know, you see more and more companies having positions like the chief public health officer now, as companies realize that uh, they need to look at the health of their whole population, not simply the companies have long had chief medical officer and now moving on to having the chief public health officer. So I do mm -hmm. think that we're shifting. I do think that, that this is shifting. And I do think 10 years from now, we'll be in a very different place in terms of the penetrance of these ideas. Great. Well, it's certainly heartening to see a rise in public health, in interest in public health schools. I'm, I'm sure it, it is. No, it, it has been, and it's been about a 20 percent increase in uh, applications for public health schools across the board. What do you think the role of the media has been, both in terms of how it's covered the pandemic, but also in this whole notion of um, the American tendency to overemphasize medical care and perhaps underemphasize public health issues? What's the role yes. of the media in all that? Yeah, it's an unfortunate question to us towards the end of our conversation because there goes a whole other hour now discussing the media. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think two things. I mean, number one is. Uh, I think the media is shapes the public conversation I'm talking about. It shapes the 
you know, you asked me about my magic wand questions to change the conversation at the kitchen table. And the media shapes a lot of that. So I think that's critical that the media understands this, what causes us help so that the media can be a part of making this, shifting us in the right conversation, number one. Number two, in the context of the pandemic, I think it's been a troubling moment for the media. My assessment is that uh, the we have been, the, the curated media, to call it that, or the mainstream media, has been so led by the, by the rise of social media. This is the first really national crisis that we've lived through in a social media era. And social media is a very particular medium. As you know, it's an, it's an algorithmically driven, driven medium that elevates and rewards emotion and, uh, and drama. And that, to my, in, my, in my assessment, has not been balanced by the curation of the mainstream media, which is what we needed that to happen. Um, and it didn't happen at this time. And, and I think we will learn this. I do think that this was a, a dramatically new moment. In much the same way as 9-11, for example, was lived with the new medium of 24-7 news cycle, and we had to learn how to deal with that then. I think we need to learn how to deal with social media entering the public square and what that means and what that doesn't mean for our broader conversation. So I think there is a lot of, there are a lot of these conversations to be had. I did a, a conversation like this hosted by the Pulitzer Center in Washington, and the, the media argument came up quite a bit. And what I got from that is that there really hasn't been this conversation in the media yet. I, I'm, I'm sure it will happen because I think it's a conversation that has to happen. Right. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation that I think many people probably assume was going to be mostly about personal protective equipment and stockpiles and vaccines and masks. But instead, we've been talking more generally about American society and how, how that uh, what we do and how we are as a people shapes our red readiness for the next pandemic. And I'm afraid we've reached the point in the program where there's time for only one last question. One, one last question for you. And, 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 and here's what it is. Um, we, we obviously don't know when the next pandemic will arrive or how bad it will be, but we are pretty sure it's coming. So when we think about preparing for the contagion next time, where do you see the most promising efforts going on and, and the reasons to be optimistic that we'll handle it better next time? I... I think there's optimism everywhere, and I choose to see optimism. To see optimism, and I choose to lean into hope. I do think the world is better than it was 50 years ago, and it was 100 years ago, and I think 50 years from now the world will be better. And I, I suppose this very conversation fills me with hope because the fact that we're having a conversation means that we're open to the ideas. The fact that Mark, you were willing to engage in this conversation, the Commonwealth Club was willing to engage in this conversation, that fills me with hope. And I, uh, I look at the next generation. I look at their enthusiasm for these ideas. And I think all of this says that we're going to be headed in the right direction. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some sleeves rolled up hard work. But the, the, the arc of history teaches us that we move in the right direction. Might be some steps forward and steps back. Uh, and it's hard work, but we'll get there. Well, that's great. And uh, the good news is, as polarized as we are about specific issues, uh, pretty much everyone agrees that good health is a good thing for themselves and for everybody else. So. There's lots of challenges on how to get there, but at least there's gen general agreement on the goal. So uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's program. But I want to thank Dr. Sandra Galea for spending time with us this morning. And of course, I want to encourage everyone to purchase a copy of his new book, The Contagion Next Time, wherever books are sold. It is, I can tell you, uh, an important and thought-provoking book. I'm Mark Zitter, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me.